Oh boy, you can't stop seeing images of funny pandas on your final exam sheet. All those late-night YouTube videos hit you hard, huh? You scribble down some words, hoping that something makes sense. You look at your watch and realize you've got only 10 minutes to finish. Panic mode is officially on, but no one knows your watch has a pinch of magic in it. You click the stop button on your watch and relax. Don't worry, no one will turn to dust and half the universe won't disappear. You simply freeze everything in time except yourself. With this ability, you can stop the time for one minute a day. So after freezing time, you get to one of your classmates, take a picture of the assignment, and head back to your seat. You unfreeze the time and write down the proper answer. Whew! At least you can guarantee a passing grade. Um, I'm Steve from Legal. Want to make sure you know that Brightside does not condone cheating on a test. Okay, carry on. You walk out of the classroom with a large smile on your face. You check your watch and it says you spent 10 seconds of time freezing. 50 seconds left. After that exam, you go and grab something to eat. You're at the traffic light waiting to cross the street. Hey, there's a girl talking on the phone and a car is speeding up to her. Everyone sees it, but nobody can do anything. And the car is only a few feet away from her. You click the stop button and everything freezes again. You run up to that girl and move her as fast as you can. Then you run back to where you were standing and click the button again to unfreeze time. Everyone is confused, but at least the girl's safe now. The whole mission took you another 10 seconds. 40 seconds left. You enter the coffee shop to grab a quick bite. As soon as you get your coffee, you turn around and lose balance. Your drink is falling down and about to spill. You click the button instinctively, and the drink is now literally hanging in the air. You collect all the droplets and put them back in the cup and click the button again. You just saved yourself 5 bucks and a dry cleaner's trip. You realize you spent 15 seconds saving your drink. Ah, 25 seconds left for today. As you're walking to the bin to throw away the cup, someone bumps into you. The buckle unfastens and the watch smashes onto the ground. You pick it up and see a scratch on the display, plus some parts came off. You gather the parts, trying to fix it. As you're doing so, you see a fly next to you and shoo it off. Strangely, it doesn't even flinch. You look around and see everyone frozen in time. The person who bumped into you is still in mid-motion. The pigeons eating breadcrumbs are frozen too. So are the cars and people. Since the watch got damaged, it reversed the power. Everything is on pause, and now you've only got 25 seconds of regular time. If you waste it all, you'll be frozen in time forever. At first, you try your best to fix it, but don't know what to do. You take out your phone to browse some tutorial on how to fix a watch, but it won't load. You keep refreshing, but nothing happens. The internet can only work in real time, and 25 seconds aren't enough for anything. There's only one place now where you can learn how to fix watches in this situation. A library. You'll have to read about it and learn from scratch. You rush to the closest library, which is at the campus. Turns out, there are only a few books on how to repair watches, but they have zero info you need. You find a bike and pedal all the way across to the public library. It took you four hours to get there. Once you've arrived, you look at endless bookshelves. You could easily switch back to real time and ask the librarian where to find what you need. But then it might take longer than you have left. There are way more books than you expected. You pedal back home and grab some stuff to sleep and eat. It's going to be a long day. When you're back, you grab a few large books that seem to have the answer. No social media can distract you, since the internet doesn't even work. The time passed, and you finally finished two large mechanics volumes. But there's just one problem. You can't find volume 3. Your only chance is to turn on time to do a quick internet search on where it is. You can't download an ebook, since it will take much time and it's impossible to print in frozen time. You click the button and time resumes. Everyone looks confused about a mattress and food leftovers all over the library floor. But you do a quick internet search and find out that you can order the book now and receive it the next day. Yeah, right. It turns out the closest book is in the library on the West Coast. Bad news, you're in New York. 
And what makes it worse is that the only source was updated years ago. The book may not even be there. You freeze time again. It took you 10 seconds to get all the needed information. You have no choice but to go on a road trip that will take around half a year by bike. No other vehicle is available to you. You find the best bike and gear, pack up some provisions, and leave the town. You travel through the mountains, swamps, and dry lands. You bike through frozen waterfalls and cut across heavy storms, frozen in time. You find indoor places to sleep, since time is frozen during the day. But you actually took your time getting there and lengthened your trip to see all the sights around the country. You spent a week at the Grand Canyon and a month in Yellowstone. You went up to bears and wolves so you can actually see the details of their muzzles. You even decided to pedal all the way to Mexico to check out the amazing scenes and landscapes around. You visited all the cities and towns without worrying about money or a proper place to stay. Uh, Steve from Legal again. Brightside does not condone using stuff without paying for it. Remember, this is a fantasy trip. Okay, continue. After covering all of Mexico, you continue all the way down through Central America, where you got to witness even more amazing sights and landmarks. Hey, you've already gone this far. Why not continue pedaling down to South America? You can even visit your friend in Argentina. I mean, he wouldn't know you're there, but it would be nice to pay him a little visit. After sunbathing in Brazil and mountain climbing in Bolivia, you end up at the southernmost point in South America and admire the journey you took. Right across the ocean is Antarctica. It's impossible to get a boat and sail there, so you decide it's time to get back to business. According to your calculations, it took you about four years to complete this journey. But you finally reached the library. You take out some water to drink, but accidentally drop the watch on the ground and resume time. Everyone is in motion. Cars are honking their horns. Dogs are barking. People are screaming and shouting at each other. You haven't heard a human voice in such a long time. Some people are staring at you. You're overwhelmed by all the energy around you. But suddenly, wake up from it. You fumble trying to find the watch. Here it is. You stop the time. Only three seconds left. You spend what seems to be another month in that large library trying to find the third volume. You've got no more time to do another internet search with those three seconds. After you finally found it, you spend two more months figuring out how to fix your watch. When you're done, All you have to do is click the button to bring everything back to normal. But you decide to pedal all the way back home. You clean up all the mess in the library and go back to the coffee shop where it all started. You even return the bike you borrowed. This is it. Three seconds to see if all that work was for nothing. You click the button and watch time move on. You look at your watch. Three, two, one. Whew! Everything is back to normal. You go back home and lock up that watch in your drawer, never to look at it again. Until next time. 15,000 years after the construction of the first space colony, planet Kepler 452b, 1,400 light years from old Earth. Hello, first year students. We're glad to welcome you to the Intergalactic University. Endless space is now home for us humans. But thousands of years ago, we used to live on just one planet we now call Old Earth. Yes, I understand it's difficult to believe. Today, it's one huge nature reserve. Mammoths and stegosaurs walk on its surface, and pterodactyls fly in its skies. It turned out to be easier to recreate animals that roamed it millions of years ago than to understand how our ancestors lived. The Great Cataclysm made them abandon the planet in a hurry leaving much of its legacy behind. And now, we're studying it anew. But our excavations leave more questions than answers. Skyscrapers, highways, shopping centers, coffee shops, everything is buried under sand and soil. Rust has eaten away the metal, and time turns concrete into dust. Even the Hoover Dam and the Three Gorges Dam in China have crumbled. The colossal structures turned into heaps of stones. The remaining buildings have become overgrown with plants and turned into a home for millions of living creatures. 
But there's good news as well. Faces carved into Mount Rushmore are still visible. The mountain is granite, and this rock is one of the hardest on old Earth. For over 15,000 years, the faces of U.S. presidents have deteriorated by only two inches. The monument will stand for millions of years. And the latest expedition to the Sahara Desert managed to dig out the Great Pyramid from the sand. Now any tourist can buy a ticket and look at that wonder, which even Earthlings considered very old. Surprisingly, ruins and crumbling walls of medieval castles in Europe have survived. They're built of massive stones and without metal fittings, which expand and destroy the stone when rusting. Our ancestors left behind a huge amount of garbage. Empty bottles, plastic packaging, wrappers. All this helps scientists to recreate the consumption patterns of people of the past. Thanks to this, we know for sure that in the 2000s, almost 8 billion people ate mostly chips, chocolate bars, and pizza. And they rarely drank ordinary water. They loved coffee, though. 60% of Earthlings lived on the internet for 7 hours a day. 2 billion websites worked 24-7. At first, information was stored on hard disks, flash drives, and compact disks. But this kind of storage went obsolete after a couple of years. The cloud took their place. It was an online storage with servers connected to the global network. They recorded the entire life of Earth's civilization and were stored in data centers. In space, the Earth's internet didn't work well. Apparently, huge distances and lack of technical knowledge did their job. Imagine that a Pluto resident wants to know the difference between margarita and calzone pizzas. They click the link and wait for a couple of hours for it to open. If the dough's already in the oven, no good. Each colony organized its own internet by sending satellites to orbit their planets. It took time to connect thousands of colonies into the intergalactic web we now know as Uninet. When the cataclysm struck, people had to escape, leaving their planet to its fate. Electricity went out, no one maintained the servers and data centers, and lots of info about their civilization was lost. We've scanned miles deep into the Earth and found many interesting artifacts. Students, I invite you to look at this amazing thing. The Earthlings called it a camera. People took pictures of their food, morning runs, and new shoes on it. One thing our scientists couldn't comprehend, though, is that ancient people used to communicate with its help, too. One of the main mysteries of the past are the dishes of different sizes. Archaeologists find them in almost every home. They bear these names. Buddy, Cosmo, Rex, Princess. We know these were the things from which dogs and cats ate, but we don't know why people pampered these animals so much. For example, archaeologists recently unearthed a beauty salon for poodles in San Francisco. I also love my dragon from the jungles of Galisa 832C, but I don't perm its fur and manicure its claws. And this is my favorite artifact, a book. There's nothing more valuable in the universe. There's only one sample in my antiques collection. It's a cooking recipes anthology. I paid a fortune for it. The ruins of museums are treasures for archaeologists and all the new humanity. These buildings collapsed a long time ago and now look like ordinary hills, overgrown with trees and grass. Museums are like pearls in the ocean. They lie at the bottom and wait to be fished from their shells. And sometimes, archaeologists manage that. Books, paintings, documents, and clothes have mostly turned to dust. But we can enjoy the statues that were carved out of marble by masters of ancient Greece and Rome. On the walls of caves around the world, there are drawings of animals and handprints of the first people. They didn't know how to read, drive a car, or fly a spaceship. But their paintings have survived. It's incredible. Over thousands of years, time has eaten up huge dams, cities with skyscrapers and bridges, and the palm of an ancient human still adorns the cold and rough wall of a cave. Space archaeology is becoming more and more popular. Thousands of tons of space debris fly around old Earth. 
the real sensation is the discovery of the Voyager 1 probe. Earthlings sent it into space at the very beginning of their development. I see your condescending smiles. Today, such a device can be assembled by any first-year student from spare parts in their parents' garage. But, dear students, let's not laugh at our ancestors. They tried their best. Voyager isn't a simple satellite. The device can be compared to a message in a bottle thrown into the sea. And the cosmic sea is millions of times larger than the Pacific Ocean of old Earth. Engineers of the past left a time capsule with a message in the probe. It contains photographs of people and the nature of the planet, as well as scientific information about the Earth. 90 minutes of recorded music are of particular interest. This is a real gift from our ancestors to us, to the people of space. Radio signals that humankind sent into space have also survived. We've tracked them. Radio broadcasts, phone conversations, even music charts continue their journey through space. Millions of years later, they'll weaken and leave behind only an electromagnetic echo. In 2020, there were 1.4 billion cars on old Earth. Unbelievable! But they moved along asphalted roads on rubber tires, not in the air. When humans flew into space, they left their vehicles on the planet. Within just a couple hundred years, the cars went completely bust and turned into piles of metal, plastic, and rubber. One that survived for millennia was the lunar roving vehicle. There's no air, no water, and no earthquakes on the moon. Anything that comes here becomes kind of suspended in time, and that's what happened to the rover. Archaeologists have found a lot of other whole and crash spacecraft on the moon. These devices are priceless artifacts in the Museum of Primitive Earth Technology. In the Svalbard Archipelago in the Arctic Ocean, scientists have unearthed the Global Seed Vault. Earthlings built it in 2008. It became a real sensation. The huge silo contained 4.5 million samples of 500 seeds each. Billions of seeds have helped provide agriculture for the colonies. Now you can eat popcorn and hamburgers with real bread rolls thanks to those. For thousands of years, the seeds were kept without human attention. This isn't a miracle, but an accurate scientific calculation. The vault is built underground at a depth of 390 feet. There are no earthquakes or floods there, and the permafrost provided the optimum temperature for the seeds to survive. Most metals are mined from ore. These ores don't contain pure metals, but only their chemical compounds. To get pure iron, the ore must be smelted first. But there's a problem. Metals from ore oxidize on contact with water or oxygen. Simply put, they rust. This is how metal returns to its natural ore state. That's why nails, metal fences, bridges, and houses rust and collapse. But this doesn't happen with gold, silver, and platinum. Things made from these metals are eternal and will never lose their shape. Of course, if you don't start hitting the rings and pennants with a hammer. During excavations, archaeologists find thousands of jewelry items. Earthlings love to wear them on their bodies. Crowns, luxurious necklaces, wedding rings. All this jewelry is now history kept in galactic museums. So, once they explode, stars aren't supposed to come back to life. But some of the stars somehow have survived the great supernova explosion. Such zombie stars are pretty rare. Scientists found a really big one called LP4365. It's a partially burnt white dwarf. Now, a white dwarf is a star that has burned up all of the hydrogen, and that hydrogen was previously its nuclear fuel. In this case, the final explosion was maybe weaker than it usually is, not powerful enough to destroy the entire star. It's like a star wanted to explode but didn't make it, which is why part of the matter still survived. One of those zombie stars used to be a white dwarf or just left over from an explosion. It gobbled up too much from another star and, surprisingly, managed to explode once again. If you manage to go to the moon one day and see fresh footprints, that doesn't mean there's someone else there with you. 
Footprints or similar marks can last for a million years over there, because the moon doesn't have an atmosphere. There are no winds, not even a breeze, that can slowly erase those footprints. In outer space, you'd be strong enough to weld two pieces of metal together with your own hands. Okay, it has nothing to do with your strength. You could just press them together with no effort, and that's it. Oxygen in our atmosphere makes a thin layer on the surface of the metal. It's like a barrier, which is why such a trick is impossible on Earth, but perfectly logical in outer space. If you ever go to space, don't take off your spacesuit unless you're on a spaceship. Air in your lungs would expand, as well as the oxygen in the rest of your body. You'd be like a balloon, twice your regular size. Good news? The skin is elastic enough to hold you together, which means you wouldn't explode. Yeah, small comfort, huh? If you watch a very touching movie in space and start crying, your tears won't run down. They will gather around your eyeballs. Your eyes will get too dry, so you'll feel like they're burning. Any exposed liquid on your body will vaporize, including the surfaces of your tongue. Speaking of burning, there's one thing fire can't do in space. Fire can spread when there's a flow of oxygen, and since there's not any in space. If the fire breaks out in a rocket, you can simply turn off the ventilation system and voila! It can get more complicated if there's intense smoke, sparking, and material melting in conditions of reduced gravity. Regular foam fire extinguishers we use on Earth are useless here because they release foam randomly. Researchers are developing a fire extinguisher that will put out fires by using sound waves. The bigger the sound intensity, the bigger the flame they can put out. But the astronauts might end up deaf if their frequency is too high. A black hole is not like some starving monster that wanders around and has gravity so strong nothing can really escape it. When something comes close to the point of no return, which we also call the event horizon, it disappears. No way back. But quantum physics claims nothing can really destroy data. So it's a true paradox. Stephen Hawking was the one with the idea of how black holes don't really have event horizons. Maybe they have apparent horizons. Those trap things for some time only. After that, the trapped energy will somehow get away, but in a different form. When something goes into a black hole, it changes shape and gets stretched out just like spaghetti. It happens because gravitational force is trying to stretch an object in one direction, but at the same time squeeze it in another. Like a pasta paradox. Speaking of, a black hole that's as big as a single atom has the mass of a really big mountain. There's one at the center of the Milky Way called Sagittarius A. It has a mass like 4 billion suns, but luckily it's far away from us. There are more than 23,000 pieces of so-called space junk bigger than a softball floating above our planet at speeds up to 17,500 miles per hour. Woo! And there are 500,000 pieces in general, some of them the size of a marble. Space waste is generally debris made up of natural particles called meteoroids and artificial particles, like things we make on the Earth. Meteoroids orbit the Sun while the majority of human-made debris orbits our planet. For example, we launched almost 9,000 spacecraft around the world, from satellites to rocket ships. Even the tiniest pieces can damage a spacecraft at such high speeds. Galaxies, planets, comets, asteroids, stars, space bodies are things we can actually see in space. But they make up less than 5% of the total universe. Dark matter, one of the biggest mysteries in space, is the name we use for all the mass in the universe that's still invisible to us. There's a lot of it. It may even make 25% of the universe. Dark energy makes the rest of the 70% of the universe. Scientists don't know much about it, but they think dark energy could be behind the increasing expansion of the entire universe, while dark matter slows it down. Dark matter doesn't interact with us in any way that we know of, nor does it interact with itself. If it did, we might be able to find dark matter galaxies, dark matter planets, or such objects. Now, astronomers have found the largest hole we've ever seen in the universe. It's the giant void that spreads a billion light-years across. 
They found it accidentally. One of the research team members was a little bit bored and wanted to check out how things were going in the direction of the cold spot. That's an anomaly in the cosmic microwave background map, or in short, CMB. It's a faint glow of light that falls on our planet from different directions and fills the universe. It's been streaming through space for almost 14 billion years as the afterglow that occurred after the Big Bang. But instead of CMB, they realized there's a giant area way colder than they'd expected. The team started tracking radio signals, but there were no radio sources in that whole volume. That means there are no galaxies or clusters, and since it's so cold, there's no dark matter either, or regular matter, so it really doesn't matter. The giant void is empty, and researchers think it could consist of dark energy. Light can still pass through it. It's not the only void in space, but it's the biggest one we've found. The area around a star is habitable when it's not too cold or too hot for liquid water to exist on the planet surrounding it. Let's say our planet was where Pluto is. It's too far from the sun, which means our ocean and big parts of its atmosphere would freeze. But if the Earth was in Mercury's place, we'd be too close to the sun, and the water on our planet would evaporate. Such habitable area is called the Goldilocks zone. So you can see where planets are located and assume if they have a chance for life on their surface. But Europa, one of Jupiter's moons, definitely breaks the rule. It's outside of the Goldilocks zone, but still kept warm. Not from the sun directly, but Jupiter and its moons that actually pump energy into Europa. Europa changes its shape as it circles around Jupiter. It's similar to tides rising and falling on our planet. Water on the Earth changes its shape as a response to the tidal forces of our moon. When the same happens with a solid object, the object is stressed. That's how you pump energy into that object. It's like you're playing racquetball. You hit the ball around a couple of times before you start playing like you're warming it up. You kind of distort the ball every time you smack it. The surface of Europa is frozen, but it has cracks in the ice. You can see ridges in the ice where there's a crack. Then those flying chunks shift and refreeze. You'd see a similar thing if you could fly over the Arctic Ocean in the wintertime. There are ice sheets constantly breaking and refreezing. So Europa can't completely freeze. Scientists think there could be an ocean of liquid water under the icy surface. Europa is not the only moon where this is happening. Another of Jupiter's moons, Io, is also warm because of such tidal forces. Io also has volcanoes erupting from within all the time. So it's not only that the sun warms the space bodies and pumps them with energy. Many experts agree the universe might come to its end about 3 to 22 billion years from now. It's expanding all the time, which means it formed from a compact state. If it has a beginning, it's probably going to have an end as well. Yeah, I won't be around for that. One of the popular theories says the growth will slow down, and gravity will become the powerful force that will make the universe shrink. That will lead to complete chaos. Galaxies, stars, planets, space bodies, they will all move, collide, and, you know, destroy one another. It's like the reverse Big Bang. Huge chaos, but this time, everything collapses. Well, on that cheery note, always stay on the bright side of life.